Well, welcome today, uh, everyone, to the uh, session titled Database Security and the OMD, OMB Mandate for Continuous Compliance. Uh, today we're joined by Josh Ulu and Tim Hazard. Josh is our Chief Technology Officer here at Application Security. Josh is responsible for setting the, the technology vision for us uh, here at Application Security. And Tim Hazard has been with Application uh, really since about 2004. Tim has uh, been with the company <laughs> and has uh, it's close, worked closely with many of you out there in the Fed space as uh, he started the Fed division way, uh, way back in the early 2000s. So right now we're going to go ahead and hand this uh, presentation off over to uh, Josh, and uh, you can go ahead and get started, Josh. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks, folks, for joining us today. So today we'll talk about some of the threats to your databases. We'll talk about, then we'll talk about some of the requirements from OMB and various other government bodies that are that are really pushing you to do a, to do something about some of the database security issues that we stand here. And then we'll wrap up the discussion with uh, some good best practices and some real information that you can take back home and, and use to get your, your database security program moving. Now when we look at today's environment, the attackers that we're dealing with in the federal space, they're typically a mix of either the very serious, very sophisticated state-sponsored threat that we hear about in the news all the time, and I know those of you on the front lines really feel it all the time. These are extremely well-funded, extremely sophisticated organizations with limitless resources that are very targeted against some of our government secrets. Sort of on the other end of the spectrum, we've got the hacktivists. We've got the nuisance attackers that are out there that can, uh, can really be painful for us. When Anonymous went out and, and hacked the FBI and took down the CIA website, they may not have uh, stolen much sensitive data. They may not ex have exposed our state secrets. But they, sure, they certainly made us look bad in the process. And it's, it's something we've really got to deal with and worry about, as those folks are also highly motivated to get in, steal data, and in a lot of ways, they're looking to bring down parts of the government. So we've got different types of attackers out there different skill sets, different motivations, but an awful lot of technical talent that's being turned against us. At the same time, as we all know, IT infrastructures, they're just not built up to defend against the really advanced attacks that we're seeing today. And the evidence of that is in the newspaper. We keep reading about very sophisticated organizations, defense contractors, security companies, being breached through these uh, very wide-ranging advanced persistent threat uh, activities. We're finding that security, it's really just not built into the culture of most agencies. Even though when you walk the halls of pretty much every government institution, you see the security uh, poster boards on the wall telling you to keep a good password, telling you to do the right thing for security. They're just not getting through to folks. The security just hasn't been baked into the culture yet. It's often designed as an afterthought to systems or projects. But it's just so regularly that we see an entire program run, build up an application, get it ready to go to production, and then do security at the last step. And at that point, it's too late. And we've most likely got a system that's got security flaws that are so deep it's impossible to remediate. Security strategies tend to be disjointed and incomplete. And compliance checklists that we all have to deal with don't necessarily align very well to the attack vectors folks are using today. A compliance checklist may get you through some, some good practices for configuring your systems, but in a lot of cases, they're not going to keep you protected from the latest and greatest threats and attacks that folks know about but haven't had time to go through the process of, of updating those, those compliance checklists. You know, you think about it, and we're really making it easier for attackers rather than making it harder. So here's an interesting uh, a diagram. I, a lot of folks show this to me when I go out and talk to them about database security. And they say, look, here's my architecture. I've got the internet, and then I've got a web server. Behind that is an app server, and behind that is my database. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some firewalls and some web application firewalls out there in between the internet and my web servers, and I'm going to protect the whole stack. And they show me this picture really, really regularly. And they, and they often say, look, my database is protected. You can see here I've got this firewall and this web application firewall. And it's protecting the, the network that's connected to my database. Unfortunately, this picture 
is really a, it's a nice picture that shows the different components in an application stack, but it doesn't in any way show a network architecture that this application lives in. The application lives on a network, and on that network, not only is this one database app server and web server and some firewalls, there are almost always other databases out there. There's also always business users. If you've got applications, you've necessarily got folks that are going to use those applications. So there's business users connected to the network. There's also IT users and administrators connected to the network. Right? These are the folks that are setting up, configuring, managing, monitoring, running these systems. In today's world of, of outsourcing, we've always got partner and consultant networks and systems that are connected into our networks. When you actually draw out the network diagram, it becomes much more complex. That firewall and, and web application firewall, which does a great job at preventing some SQL injection attacks that come right through that, that internet gateway, it just doesn't cover all your bases. So for example, I may get attacks from other databases, databases that have been penetrated one way or another, and then using database links and just getting access to the network, another database on the system may be the attack point to get to the database that uh, somebody's trying to protect. Or maybe it's the business users. Those business users who've decided that they're not happy at work anymore, and before they quit, they're going to steal a bunch of secrets, they're going to cause a bunch of damage, going out and directly exploiting vulnerabilities in any of the databases in the environment. Or the IT users and administrators taking advantage of the, the strong privileges that they have in the environment and using those privileges to gain access to data that they shouldn't be looking at. Sorry about that. And finally, we've got the partner and consultant networks. And again, just another launch point for attacks against the databases that are out there. So while that, that, that thought of defending the application with firewalls and web app firewalls is, is important and necessary, it's just not a complete strategy in really wrapping up the database uh, in security. So here at Application Security Incorporated, we actually run the largest dedicated database security research team in the world. They're called Team Shatter. You may have heard of us. We're the ones finding in most of the vulnerabilities in the databases today and working with the vendors to get them fed. Team Shatter, much like the OWASP organization, publishes a top 10. Uh, and we track the top 10 database vulnerabilities and misconfigurations that are impacting folks out there. So we liked what OWASP was doing, and we decided to follow suit with, uh, with the database top 10. And you can see them up here. We've got default and weak passwords in databases. We've got SQL injection issues, privilege issues. We've got surface area issues with unnecessary enabled features. It's common to see configuration management done very poorly in the database. There's all sorts of, of patchable vulnerabilities like buffer overflows and denial of service conditions, uh, privilege escalation attacks. And uh, we often see folks who don't use any encryption features on their databases at all, leaving all the data in clear text, potentially exposed to administrators, and sometimes even clear across the network. So let's focus in on just one of these categories. I'd love to show you how we can exploit all of them, uh, but we don't have time for that today. Today we'll use SQL injection in the database system. And what we'll do is, is using a vulnerability in the database, we're going to inject SQL, and we're going to use that, that SQL to gain access to data in the database that we shouldn't have the ability to access. So this vulnerability, uh, it's an Oracle vulnerability, and the, the way you fix these vulnerabilities typically is applying a patch to the database. But applying a patch to a database can take time. Most organizations take six months to nine months to be able to schedule, test, and actually get a patch from dev all the way through to production. That's an awfully long time for a system to sit around with this kind of vulnerability. So today we'll, we'll, we'll attack Oracle 11G. We'll do that uh, using a SQL injection vulnerability uh, that requires me to be able to create a procedure in the database. It's very common for logins in the database to have the ability to create procedures. Folks don't think of it as a, a, as a weakness, because if, the, if you, those users don't have rights to any sensitive data, it doesn't really matter if they can create procedures. There's nothing they should be able to access. So it's a commonly granted right. In the end, we'll gain access to all the data in the database. Any data we want, we'll be able to, to extract. And we'll do that by running SQL 
is a default user in the database called WMSYS. WMSYS is, uh, is a very powerful Oracle user. It's installed by default, and it has BDA-like privileges. And so we'll be exploiting a SQL injection vulnerability in the package wmsys.lt.rollbackworkspace. There's actually a whole bunch of vulnerabilities that, uh, that our team Shatter found and Oracle has fixed in this class of, uh, rollback, of workspace management functions. Uh, this is just one of those. So let's begin the attack. Here I've got a screen where I've logged into an Oracle database. I logged in here as a user called user1 with the password user1. Now, user1 is a very low-privileged user. It's basically just got the ability to log into the database and create a procedure. Now, sort of towards the middle of the screen, you'll see that I've connected to Oracle. And the first thing I did was ran a SQL statement call that says select star from the v$dollar version. And Oracle responds with some banner information. This just shows you that I'm running Oracle 11G version 11.106. Next thing I'm going to do, almost at the bottom of the screen, is try to access some data. So I'm going to run this SQL statement here. I'm going to select uh, EMP no employee number, employee name, and salary from the table scott.emp. And when I run that SQL statement, Oracle comes back with an error. Error at line one, table or view does not exist. Now this is an interesting behavior from Oracle. When you don't have access to data in Oracle and you try to access that data, instead of the Oracle giving you some kind of access denied, you don't have permissions uh, error, it tells you that the table or view, the data that you're trying to access doesn't exist. And it does that for security reasons. The idea there was that why should Oracle tell a potential attacker about the existence of certain objects and structures in the database if that attacker was using an account that didn't have privileges to those objects or structures. So it's kind of like if you don't have privileges to see something, Oracle will deny that it's even there. So we don't have rights to access this data, but that's the data we want to access. It sounds like good stuff, right? Employee names, salary information. So what we'll do here is we'll, we'll build ourselves a function that we're going to use to, to make this attack happen. So the first step, create a replace function, user1.sqli, sqli for SQL injection. And uh, got this important part here, it's auth ID current user. Oracle's got two different kinds of uh, functions and procedures that you can create. You can create definer rights procedures and invoker rights procedures. A definer rights procedure runs with the privileges of the user that created it, whereas an invoker rights procedure runs with the privileges of the user that calls it. So when you say auth ID current user, that tells Oracle to create an invoker rights procedure, meaning whoever calls this procedure or this function that we're creating, it's going to run with their privileges. And that's one of the keys to this attack work. Now the real meat here is uh, this SQL statement here. So we've got this SQL statement that we wanted to execute before and it failed. Select employee name, employee number, salary from scott.emp. Uh, so that, that's the SQL we want to run. And you can see right below that we've got this DBMS output put line. That's just going to help us by printing fancy uh, characters to the screen so we can see what's going on. So we basically set ourselves up with this string, this select employee name, employee number string stuck in a in a, in, a, in a variable in, the in this function in the database. Now here comes the exploit. It's really this simple. We're going to take this, we're going to create a parent parameter called P workspace. Into that P workspace, we're just going to define it as a call to our, our, our function that we just created, our SQL injection function. Then we're going to call the vulnerable DBMS WM rollback workspace. We'll pass in that parameter P workspace, which we just put together, that, that it contains a function call to our SQL injection uh, routine. And remember, inside that SQL injection routine, we're trying to select the sensitive data out of the database. So when we run this, guess what? The SQL statement runs, and Oracle spits the data right out on the screen for us. We're now accessing this data as the user WMSYS. WMSYS, again, is a DBA. They have access to all the data in the database. So through this mechanism, and just simply by changing that one SQL string we saw in the last slide, we can run any SQL statement effectively against the database that we want, see any data, 
change any data, create new users, we own the system. That kind of felt complicated, right? We went through, we created a function, we had to create a procedure, we had to go through a couple of different steps. You probably have to know a lot about databases to execute this kind of attack. Maybe that's what you're thinking. Certainly what I thought when I first went through this attack and my, my research team explained it to me, it's, wow, that's complicated. Somebody went to Google and typed DBMS, uh, JVM Xperms exploit. We just type in the name of the exploit, and what comes right back out is the actual exploit code that we're loading and running. So for all of the exploits that we see out there in general, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing, but you'll actually be able to Google and click the first link in Google and pretty much find the raw exploit bits right there for you that you can just cut and paste and run against the database. So it really goes from being a sophisticated thing to attack a database to simply a motivation thing. If you can use Google and you can cut and paste, and you're on that network where the databases are sitting, it tends to be pretty trivial to go out there, find a vulnerability, all the exploit code just sitting there on the internet, cut, paste, run, and you're off there owning databases in the environment, causing all sorts of havoc. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to pass it off to Tim. Tim will give you a rundown of uh, how he sees some of the things happening out there in the federal space, and, and how some of the changes are happening around continuous monitoring. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate that. Um, I think uh, you know that what we just saw there, I mean, I remember the first time I saw that, I saw that seven, eight years ago, and it, it just kind of blew my mind, and I think the part that really jumps out at you is sort of the last part about how you don't need to be that in, uh, that, uh, that in tune with, with database hacking or databases themselves, that this information is so easily and readily available that, uh, you know, it just increases the possibility of this stuff happening. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, sort of a nice segue into why the federal government has put in a lot of, um, uh, very specifically put in a lot of uh, compliance mandates and requirements and executive order, orders out there to address this stuff. Um, you know, I think that their strategy is very um, protecting data. And what you're going to hear from us today is, is a lot more about protecting uh, data at the database. And I think that's an important part. Um, but what we're talking about really is, is in this change is it, it's moved away from concept of, you know, compliance used to be a lot of about sort of this, it's almost synonymous with certification and accreditation. It's sort of let's go out and check these systems at a point in time um, and determine what kind of shape they're in. And, and, and that's sort of our get out of jail free card. Um, that's changed. And it's changed a lot. I mean, I think basically what agencies and what OMB and the White House are figuring out is we're spending a lot of money an awful lot of money to find out what kind of shape we're in at one point in time. And they've really just, I mean, the, the, the approach has been, well, these people come in, these, these contractors and these um, auditors come in, and they're using software products to evaluate us. Well, let's take this concept of actually um, utilizing that software and running it on an ongoing basis to provide ourselves with a constant uh, picture of what kind of shape we're in. Um, and obviously, uh, you not only gain that, but you gain an awful lot of a much bigger picture of your entire organization and all of the co components that make up its IT systems and the, and the security posture at all of those. Um, and I think just this whole concept of implementing software uh, to support that instead of this very manual process um, is, has been a big um, um, uh, advancement, uh, I guess is the best way to look at it. And, and then the idea of, okay, now that we're really good at collecting all this information, uh, is the idea of getting a, a, and even a layer up from that is at the agency's requirement to provide all this information and roll it up to CyberScope. So that's what's changed. Um, Josh, can you roll the next one slide, please? Um, uh, obviously, this is, uh, Matt Coos is, is with um, uh, the Federal Network Security Division of DHS. And it's basically just a restatement of what I said, is that this is what agencies can do. This is available. The software and the tools are out there. And that they need to get this stuff in place in order to start to collect uh, this information and gather what their, their um, current situations are. OK, Josh, next one, please. Um, the WikiLeaks order, it's, it's sort of in line with continuous monitoring. It's a, it's a presidential order. It's an executive order. Um, and we all know why <laughs> it's, been, it's been put out there. But I think the important thing is it's, uh, it's another reaction to, to a, a situation that, that's come up, typically a, a security 
loss of data or loss of information, and these, these reactions come from that. Um, what we're trying to make sure that you know, we're driving the point here is that it's a responsibility to safeguard uh, uh, your information, certainly your sensitive and classified information, and that you've got programs in place, and those programs need to be addressing um, that you've got uh, built-in auditing systems, you're monitoring this access to data. If you think back to the, to the, um, the um, diagram that Josh showed at the beginning, it was sort of, uh, there's lots of ways that this is accessed. And, and to have a control of all of that and an understanding of all of that and to monitor that activity is sort of at the end of the day, ground zero for all this is, is at the database itself, the database application. Um, the other big point to make is that they're recognizing and they're calling out that the insider threat is a very big threat to the extent that the task force needs to be set up just to deal with that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, the other one that we spoke about is, again, this continuous monitoring. This came out um, uh, about this time, well, a little bit, it was probably about in the, um, uh, uh, I guess it was originated, the continuous monitoring back in, um, in 2010, and then there's been follow-up executive orders and memorandums. But they're all under the same uh, concept of a continuous monitoring programs that need to address um, the ability to use and uh, be able to use tools and be able to use um, software in an automated process to collect this information. Um, the, um, the information should be driven with policies. It should be, you know, have guidance. Um, it's, it's got cyber scope behind it, which is a, you know, the DHS um, uh, highest level of looking at this continuous posture, this continuous awareness. Um, you know, typically they won't put this stuff out there with also out with also without providing some sort of guidance and some sort of um, um, secure standards and guidelines that are put out there. Josh, can you go to the next one? So that's when you see things like this. The the DHS the same group, the Federal Network Security Branch. Um, again, this branch has been set up. It's within DHS, but it, its mission reaches well beyond DHS. Their mission is to be able to provide um, best practices and guidelines for um, security and compliance. Um, the reason we point this out specifically is this, this architecture, which they were uh, tasked to put forth, very specifically is an architecture designed for how you're going to address continuous monitoring from an architectural standpoint. What are the components? And they really sort of define it as in sort of three levels. You have scanners and sensors that are out there collecting data and looking at um, real-time um, action out on the uh, network and at different devices and data, uh, data uh, databases, whether it's web applications, databases, operating systems. Um, and all these devices are out there. Then sort of the middle layer is the layer where all this information is collected and sort of uh, normalized and analyzed. And then it rolls up to one layer higher, which does reporting and scoring. And that's sort of at a high level to be the, the Caesars architecture. The important part that we'd like to point out here is that very specifically in this document, it actually calls out for an entire section around databases and database applications. Um, and to our credit, um, you know, because of our presence in the federal space, they actually named us specifically um, our privacy protect that protected. But the more important part here is that they understand the importance of making, of collecting that information at that, at that endpoint very critical. Um, next slide, please. So there's sort of two approaches um, you know, that I've seen. When I'm out, I, I'm out talking all the time um, to the federal leadership, the, 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 the CSOs and the ISSOs and ISSMs, and how are they, you know, question them is, how are you approaching continuous monitoring? And I'd say, you know, there's sort of two ways of approaching it, or two answers I get. Um, you know, one of the ways is it's what I would define as sort of this very network-centric approach. That they're sort of saying, okay, we're very focused on um, the information that we're collecting and gathering at our network in a network scanning uh, way. And you know, sort of look at that as saying, you know, network scanners, web application firewalls. Um, so we're looking at patch management on operating systems, and that's kind of where it stops. Sort of in this approach of 
let's go out, find every box that we've got, and then scan that box. Find out what, what its situation is. And that's kind of where it ends. Um, and obviously, if you're talking about you know, agencies, it's certainly at the, uh, you know, the department level or even at the agency or component levels, you're talking about tens of thousands of endpoints. And obviously, it's a very, very large project or massive undertaking. Um, you know, at the same time, there's some folks, and this has become a much more popular way recently, very recently, to, to approach this is to say, let's see a data-centric approach to this problem. Um, we've got thousands of endpoints, but of all those endpoints, which ones contain sensitive information? And which ones contain sensitive information in volumes where, you know, I have to sit in front of Congress and explain how I've lost millions of records. Um, and that's sort of a whole different approach. It's, it's sort of this data-centric approach, much more of a sniper-type approach. And obviously, when you're talking about agencies that have thousands of endpoints, and maybe up to tens of thousands of endpoints, versus an agency that may have you know, a few hundreds or maybe in the hundreds of database instances, and, you know, obviously, this approach uh, I think a lot of people start to look at it much more of a, a return on their investment or a bang for their buck, so to speak, in that where, where is the area that I can look to address, put the, the, the software and the resources behind it to lock that asset down and gain the biggest return on that investment? In other words, measured in a, uh, a, a reduction of my risk or reduction of the possibility of losing data. And it's sort of logically you would say the closer you are to where that, um, to where that data lives, the better your chances are of reducing the loss of that data. I mean, I always, at this point, I, you know, I sort of use the analogy of a bank. You know, banks are built, and they're built with walls and roofs, and they're built with infrared eyes and alarm systems, but they don't take the cash, and they don't throw it in the middle of the floor. You know, the most expensive and the most well-architected item in that bank to protect that asset of cash is a vault. And I think that, that we're starting to get into a, in a scenario um, in IT security where it's being looked at the same way. It's sort of security being built around the data and, the, and where the data lives in volume and working your way out. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I think this is just, uh, you know, we're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail, but it's this network-centric approach, and, and again, looking at this from a bang for your buck, it, it's not like you don't need this. It, it's part of every uh, IT security infrastructure already. Um, the, the, the problem with it is is that these defenses have been out there for a while. The attackers know how to, to, to get around them. And I think the most important thing is that most of the attacks occur you know, where it's already a valid credential. You are coming in as someone that is accepted. They would never even stop. Um, and even more importantly, um, you know, as, we, as we've seen with WikiLeaks or as we've seen with a lot of losses of data, um, that those attacks originate from the inside, whether that's a disgruntled employee or whether it's, a, it's a, and actually uh, an employee that's just sort of fumbled the ball a little bit on how they're handling the data that they're accessing and, and gathering, and that maybe they shouldn't be, you know, extracting 20 million records in order to, to take the work home with them and work at that night. That's a very, you know, you, you've now put yourself at a, at a pretty high security risk. Um, next, um, next slide, please. So, which approach is best? And, and it's always going to be a combination of both. I mean, you're going to hear the, the, the term defense in depth all the time. And it really is the best way to do it. I certainly would never sit here and say that, um, you know, that there's no need to do the things that you're currently doing with the locking down of every endpoint. I mean, I think that that's, that's a project uh, that should be going on. Um, I think it's a project that will probably never end and will always go on because it's, it's such a, uh, a large and, you know, ever-changing uh, environment. But I think that in parallel, an approach that is really looking at, uh, you know, like I described before, is the sniper approach, where you're really looking to focus in on where this data lives and where it lives in volume and attack it there. And again, you, you, you return on the investment there. Like, what is the what is the project that I should be looking to get into that's going to give me my reduction of risk? Floating around the outside probably doesn't increase your chance as much. You could put up firewall after firewall after firewall, and if your problems are coming from inside, it's never going to help you. Um, 
knowing what's going on at the data, knowing if the database in fact is vulnerable, and then locking that down, and then knowing actually what activity is going on at the database, and if it's acceptable uh, activity or not, is really a much better way to at least approach this and to get all you in a parallel manner. And Josh, next one, please. So what you're seeing come out of, whether it's Congress or whether it's, it's research that's been um, commissioned by the different government agencies, is that there is a big focus on data. Um, we sort of throw the word data around, and it, you, know, you sort of have to look at tying that data to where it lives. Um, you, you know, congressionally, when they speak of that all of the laws that are, coming, that, are going, that are coming out now are laws that are currently uh, being reviewed. It's all about protecting information or data. So the question you have to answer yourself is, where does that live and where does it live in bodies? And obviously the answer to that is enterprise database applications. Um, and you know, so to support that, Verizon has been commissioned, um, and, and not just by Secret Service and some other scenarios too, but in their result and what they're finding is that 92% of the records stolen are attributed to direct tax at the database, which is pretty logical. I think it needs to be really pointed out but because that number is so high when you're talking about 92%. But again, it's where sophisticated attackers are going. They're going to put a lot of effort into this. They're going to want to pull back a lot of information that's valuable. Next slide, please. So sort of take this back to tying it to compliance requirements. I mean, I think as we all know, and if we're in the federal space, we see is that a lot of what um, can be justified as a project, and putting a project together um, in, in, or making something part of your continuous monitoring project overall, um, is really tied to um, being able to tie it to some compliance requirements. You know, and there's a lot out there. But I think you know, the ones that we can really focus on um, you know, that really tie directly to us uh, and give this a lot of uh, justification are things like you have to be able to identify and report on the location of your sensitive data. You have to know where it is. And you have to have an accurate inventory uh, of database applications. Just so like you have to have, an, have to have an accurate inventory of other IT assets. Um, you have to be able to ensure that the databases are configured within the DOD guidelines. Um, this is big is the one that really jumps out. I think what most people map to, but they are very specifically. Uh, uh, big guidelines for database applications, whether it's Oracle or SQL Server or IBM, um, they're out there. The reason they exist is because they are supposed to be configured like that and to those uh, to those standards. Um, you also have a responsibility to go in once you've identified these these vulnerabilities. You have to identify them and then go in and remediate those vulnerabilities. You have to go in and, and enforce the separation of duties and these privileges. You have to prove that in the way the database application is set up and it's set up correctly. Uh, with its accounts and its privileges, and they have to prove that those are the least privileges that have been extended out there. Um, and the other thing is you have to be able to immediately report on suspicious or unauthorized activity. So I'll certainly you'd have to know that it's happening, number one. And number two, you have to be able to report on that quickly. Those are requirements uh, that absolutely are out there and clearly apply to database applications. Next slide, please. To take this one layer deeper, um, this is a little bit of a tough slide to read, um, but what it really does is it sort of takes these into uh, the categories across the top uh, that I just discussed. It sort of maps it to uh, very specific federal mandates or federal guidelines, the numbers that show up after when you go down the left-hand column. Um, that you have to identify and report of the location of sensitive data. That's that's DG0107. That's a disestig guideline. Um, all of the vulner all of the configuration guidelines, vulnerability management, access and need to know. These are federal terms. They're not our terms. The stuff across the top from us is our terms. It's our sort of best practices terms. The check box is sort of uh, substantiate that this is a compliance requirement or a mandate that you're supposed to be. Um, stuff is really not, shouldn't be new to any security professionals um, because these are all the same things that will apply to other assets. You know, the most, um, the most uh, obvious example is an operating system. 
all of these same things apply. It's just sort of where where they're also applied when, when you look at them at the database. It's the same things that apply just to a database application. And then the argument clearly there could be, you know, from a from a priority um, of what should be looked at from a security and compliance perspective, databases, um, you know, with the information that they hold and how they hold it in volumes should be one that you are applying and marking these checkboxes off with um, and meeting these compliance requirements uh, and not sort of saying, well, the database is sort of going up the stack. It's the last place we're going to get, so we'll get to it when we get to it. Um, I don't think that bodes well from a security standpoint. Um, uh, next slide, please. So Josh is going to pick it up here, and he's going to sort of walk through those steps. You know, a lot of people say, so where should we start? And um, I think that uh, this is a good place for Josh to sort of go through some, some of these steps of how to get started in database security and compliance and, and those best practices that, that we recommend. Thanks, Tim. So folks, we, we recommend that you implement a fairly simple five-step process to protect your databases, to ensure compliance, to meet your continuous monitoring demands. And it's all fairly simple. It starts out with isolating your sensitive databases. So the first step, understand what you've got in the environment. Then we're going to move on to eliminating vulnerabilities. So we want to reduce the different types of attacks that the bad guys can exploit. We'll move on from there to enforcing least privileges. So make sure we're not granting excessive privileges out to users. Then we'll monitor for deviations and round it up by responding to suspicious activity. So let's dig into each of those steps here. The first step is to isolate our sensitive databases. And the reason why we've got to do this is really we've got to understand what databases are in our environment first. It's not unusual for us to find unknown or unauthorized databases in an environment. Those unknown and unauthorized databases, they don't fall under the, the sort of umbrella of security in a typical case. So they become launching points or they become soft spots where somebody can go after an attack. So you've got to find those unauthorized databases. And that means database discovery. With database discovery, go out, crawl the entire network, interrogate all the systems out there, and find out which ones are running databases. So you can identify where all of your databases are, both those authorized known systems like your production databases and your development and test databases, as well as those unknown, unauthorized databases that have found their way onto the network or haven't found their way off of the network when they should have. Now, it's not enough just to know which databases you've got. You've also got to know which ones have sensitive data. So sensitive data discovery is, is sort of the next step in isolating your sensitive databases. It's actually going through the databases and hopefully in an automated way, crawling through the data, identifying which systems are storing sensitive data, what types of sensitive data is being stored and exactly where it is. You can see in this picture here, we've got sensitive data not only in our production database, but also in our development and test, and even in one of our unauthorized databases. So we want to remove unauthorized databases, or we want to bring them under IT control so they can be properly protected. And of course, we want to remove sensitive data from any unauthorized databases that are out there. Next step in the process is to eliminate database vulnerabilities. Now, when you get a new database, come in and install it from one of the database vendors, it comes with some security built in. We call that standard database security. Unfortunately, standard database security has got some holes in it. So we've got weakened default passwords that are there by default in the database, sort of standard. We've got misconfigurations. Out of the box, databases don't tend to be configured for security. They tend to be configured for convenience. And so you've got a lot of misconfigurations from a security perspective that, that are really impacting the system right from day one. And finally, security patches. Database vendors are releasing security patches all the time. Some of them have a ton of vulnerabilities in them. We see a lot of patches coming out lately from Oracle and from IBM, but there, there are just holes in the database from the minute you install it until the minute you patch it up to date, and it won't be long after that before a new patch is available and there's more holes in that standard database security. It's not good enough. We've got to do better to protect our sensitive data. So we've got to eliminate these avenues for attack. And the way we do that is with vulnerability management. So we go out and penetration test the databases, we do security and configuration auditing on the databases, and we can really ring fence that, that, that database beyond the standard database security with, with far more rigorous 
and and uh, and far more effective database security. So we're going to identify all database vulnerabilities that are out there threatening sensitive data. We'll prioritize our remediation plans, right? So we want to make sure that we're doing all of our fixing and remediating in priority order. Fix the stuff that's important first. Provide detailed remediation instructions to, to facilitate rapid fixes. So it's not enough just to go to the ops team and say, hey, guys, you've got a bunch of problems, go fix them. You need to provide those folks with detail about the problems and about the, the mechanisms they need to use to go about fixing those problems. A resource like the Shatter Knowledge Base that comes again from our research team will really help you and, and, and ensure your alignment with the latest attack vectors. So of course you need to know about the latest attack vectors, the latest vulnerabilities, in order to search for them, scan for them, and fix them. On to step three, enforce least privileges. Typical that over time employees will gain and gain and gain privileges. Sometimes it's because of a promotion, sometimes a transfer, sometimes it's technical issues like inheritance of privileges. But what you'll find is that users almost always get more privileges and almost never lose privileges that they've obtained through their careers. And that leads to a situation where users have a mix of the least privileges, the appropriate privileges they need to do their jobs, and a whole bunch more stuff which we'll call excessive privileges. The problem is it's hard to figure it out. It's hard to figure out in a system what privileges a user actually has, particularly the database systems out there that are, that are storing your sensitive data. They have extremely complicated access control systems, and the database itself doesn't have any way to tell you who has access to what data. You can't get a report out of an Oracle or a SQL Server database that says, here's the user that can access this data, here's the user that can access that data. They can't even tell you who's a database administrator or a privileged user. It's really complex stuff. So you need a, a solution, sorry, we need a solution around our, around our database privileges. And that, that comes down to rights management. And so rights management will allow you to provide a detailed view of your organization's data, who owns that data, access controls around that data, and most importantly, Who's got rights to sensitive data? Who can see it? Who can change it? Who, who has ownership effectively over the sensitive data in that system so that you can go from there, eliminate the privileges that are unnecessary, and reduce your access controls down so that folks are using the principle of least privilege and they have access based on a need to know. All right, so we've gone out there. We found our databases and our sensitive data. We've locked them down with eliminating vulnerabilities and misconfigurations. We've reduced the privileges in the system so that users have the least privileges possible to do their jobs. The next step is to monitor for deviations. So I'm talking about monitoring activity in the database real time, 24-7. And when we look at data, database activity, we can usually bucket it into three categories. So we've got sort of the standard database activity. This is the normal business logic that's executing against the database that they're designed for, that you're looking for, that you're hoping for. On either side of that, we've got unauthorized activity, and then we've got suspicious activity. So unauthorized activity is the kind of stuff that's the vulnerability allows somebody to get unauthorized access to data or a user who has more privileges than they should have exploits those privileges and gains access to data. Now we can eliminate that unauthorized activity from monitoring scope by fixing our vulnerabilities and reducing our, our privileges. So vulnerability and rights management that we've talked about takes care of that unauthorized activity. It just takes it right off the board. Now with database activity monitoring and precision database activity monitoring, you then have the ability to filter out that standard database activity. That normal day-to-day -day business, the good, appropriate traffic, there's no reason to pay any attention to it. You need to identify it as normal and, and, and appropriate and then kind of brush it to the side. And what that allows you to do is laser focus in on the suspicious activity, the unusual use, the potentially inappropriate use of your suspicious data that you, or your sensitive data that you need to be able to react to immediately. So with monitoring, we can make sure that the vulnerabilities we've remediated actually have been remediated. We can monitor for any vulnerabilities we haven't fixed being exploited. 
We can watch what our privileged users are doing, and we can look for any new avenues of attack that users are exploiting. Finally, we need to respond. So when we see suspicious activity, we can wrap up a custom policy. We really need to, to wrap up a response to that suspicious activity. So when we see somebody accessing business data through an ad hoc query tool, maybe that's suspicious activity. And we want to take a response to that. So the policy sort of governs what is the response. And maybe the response is simply to alert the IT or the security team, maybe by buzzing a pager, maybe, maybe by alerting a, a SIEM type system. Maybe the response is to open a trouble ticket uh, and, and issue to the trick ticketing system some work for somebody to do to investigate. Maybe what we see appears to be a code injection into one of our web pages, and we want to initiate a malware scan to make sure somebody has an embedded malicious links or, or actually stuck malware into our database that's feeding content out to our web page. Or maybe we simply want it to, to take the basic route and block the activity. We see suspicious activity, unusual abnormal access to data. Maybe we want to just simply block that and disallow that access to data. That's how we respond to suspicious activity. We're going to classify that activity, decide how we want to react, and then take that reaction to that's appropriate for the data that's, that's at risk in the particular event that we're observing. So just a simple example, let's say we've got a database storing sensitive data, in this case cardholder information. Well, we've got privileged users on the inside, right? and those privileged users can put out a mix of authorized activity, again, normal business, day-to-day -day type of stuff, as well as unauthorized activity. Particularly our DBAs and our databases, they have access typically to all the data in the database and you can't take it away from them. But that doesn't mean they should be looking at that data. So it's, it's generally unauthorized activity for a database administrator to look at the business data in the system. So we need to be able to differentiate that from their normal authorized activity and respond to it. Same goes for an outside attack, somebody coming in from the outside, the outside of the database that is, potentially the outside of the network as well, and attempting to attack that database and take the data from inside of it. With something simple like blocking, or more comprehensive like an active response that allows you to really choose your reaction, you can terminate sessions, you can lock out users, and you can most importantly reduce the set of activity that actually reaches and executes against that database to just the authorized activity that you've decided is appropriate for your environment. So that wraps up the presentation today, folks. Uh, appreciate you spending the time to join us. We will open the floor to questions, uh, so feel free to type in some questions into the, into the webinar panel, and uh, we'll get to as many as we can while we still got some time. Uh, Jeff, I'm not seeing the questions because I'm a panelist, not an organizer. So why don't you read out the questions to me, and we'll just uh, we'll just take them as they come. All right, sounds great, Josh. Uh, so we have a, a a question that's come in about continuous monitoring. Um, uh, as already being identified as one of the security cro uh, controls in the NIST SP uh, uh, 853 requirement, and uh, the question is really. What's the what's the new news about this particular uh, um, requirement? Is there anything new that should be uh, that the company should be concerned about? Tim, do you want to talk about the, uh, the the changes since continuous monitoring term was first used in 853 and 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 how NIST is talking about it today? Yeah, I mean, so I guess I'm not sure if I'm exactly answering the question, um, but. It's sort of been a, the, the, you know, continuous monitoring um, was sort of been introduced, you know, it's been a while back since it's been introduced and just the concept of uh, gaining a lot more information in, in real time as well as on a much more consistent basis of, of your um, systems. I guess to sort of illustrate like what's changed and how has this grown in importance can be, um, and you can see that in the fact that there's 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 new special publications that have come out that NIST has put out that are specifically about continuous monitoring. It's not you know it used to be a a 
a reference in 853, but now continuous monitoring has its own special publication. And that's, I think it's 800-137. Uh, I'm not absolutely positive about that, but if you if you were to do a Google search on the NIST SP um, 800 publications and continuous monitoring, you'd find it. But it, it, it is basically sort of a round two of the Caesars doc, architecture document and dives a lot more deeper into what those compliance requirements are and how to meet them. I hope that answers the question. Uh, great. And uh, this, this question, and I'll answer this, is a question about is the, the recording going to be available? And that, the answer to that question is, uh, is yes, within the next 24 to 48 hours, we'll send out a link to all the registrants and uh, attendees with, uh, to uh, a recording of the webinar that you can rewatch uh, re or share with your uh, colleagues. Uh, another question has come in about uh, training programs. Uh, does application security offer any training programs uh, for the federal state? So we sure do. We offer a, a whole variety of, of different kinds of training. Uh, a lot of the training that we offer is focused around how to build a database security policy and program, and then how to implement that program using our product. We've got uh, a suite of products that are built both for the uh, the audit OIG type, as well as for the the enterprise information security team to uh, to go out and implement these database controls and measure the database controls uh, that are out there. So we've, we've got training both on the product side as well as on the uh, the standards and policy development side for organizations that are really just getting started and need to wrap their heads around what are the requirements from NIST, what are the requirements from CISA. How do they impact me as well as my contractors? Uh, we, we can definitely help answer all those types of questions that you have. Uh, great. And uh, this next question is about uh, how it how organizations can uh, comply with continuous monitoring around tools. So, what type of tools, including open source tools, are available for continuous monitoring of uh, MySQL database? So there's not a ton out there uh, around MySQL. Uh, our products all support MySQL, so we can we can do database discovery and vulnerability assessment and, and all that against uh, MySQL databases. Uh, there may be a little bit of open source out there. I believe there was a, a product uh, called Green SQL that was doing some uh, MySQL stuff that was open source, but. Uh, to, to be honest, my, my, the MySQL community has changed really significantly over the last year, year and a half since Oracle acquired MySQL. Uh, folks have really felt different about the MySQL project under the Oracle banner. And, and honestly, I've seen a big migration over to Postgres. Uh, it, that's a platform that's gaining some popularity and one we're looking at keenly. But, but getting this database security know-how and, and assessment and monitoring is tough. It really is. There's not a lot of organizations that are offering it commercially. There's very, very few folks that are uh, that, have, that have done anything in the open source community. There's just not that much uh, skill set out there to, to build the, the technology to go out and do database security and compliance. It's a uh, it's a pretty rare skill to set, skill set to find. Okay, great. I think that's all we have uh, really have time for today. So, Josh, if you want to just kind of wrap things up and. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, you know, we've given you a bunch of information today. As Jeff mentioned, the, the recording will be available up on our website within a couple of days. I urge you to visit um, our, our website, both teamshatter.com, which is our ThreatCon site, where you'll find everything database security and no sales pitch whatsoever, as well as appsecinc.com, where you'll find all the sales pitch you're looking for. Now we did have one more question come in. It's a quick one. I'll grab it before we go. It's about uh, DB Protect and SCAP compliance. DB Protect is SCAP compatible, so SCAP uh, doesn't doesn't facilitate things like actually connecting to and scanning a database. So we can't call ourselves compliant, but we sure do take SCAP input and spit out SCAP output uh, as much as we can to maintain compatibility. And over time, as SCAP evolves, uh, we are committed to SCAP compliance as well. Again, thanks everyone for joining us and uh, appreciate the time today.